John 1 verses 9 to 12 says, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Today we are examining mission. We are remembering our call to others. And we are asking ourselves what it means for us to live lives that are somehow not defined by human-made boundaries. John 1 tells the cosmic story of Jesus, the Word, breaking down unimaginable boundaries and making his dwelling among us. It tells the story of God himself looking to be received, to be welcomed by his creation. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. There was no room at the inn, and to this day, there still seems to be very little room in our lives and our world for the one who came to give us light. So how can we live differently? How can we be counted among those who did receive Jesus? And, as a reward, we're given the right to become children of God. One key is found in Matthew 25, a story Jesus shared about the judgment at the end of the world, and a central passage on what it means to be a people who choose to receive Jesus. After separating the metaphorical sheep and goats to the right and left, it says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my, by my Father, Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Of course, we know that this teaching of Jesus continues, and we see that those who rejected or ignored the world's needs were, in turn, rejected by Jesus. But to the people on his right, who in that moment were confounded and were confused, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. There's something mystical here, something our brains fight to comprehend. But I believe it is also something shockingly literal. When we care for others, we are somehow actually loving and blessing Jesus himself. I remember a number of years ago visiting Egypt. Some friends of mine invited me to go on a boat ride on the Nile. At one point, my hosts drew my attention to the edge of the river. They pointed out a particular church there. The church is traditionally believed to have been built on the spot where Joseph, Mary, and infant Jesus stopped and rested after their refugee journey into Egypt. This church, which dates back to the 4th century, has built its identity and reputation on one simple fact. Here, where we are standing, is where Egypt welcomed Jesus. The Holy Family's Christmas refugee story is briefly told in Matthew 2, which says, When the Magi had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Mary and Joseph took their son and fled from the tragedy and horror of their situation, and Israel's terrible loss turned into Egypt's blessing. Traditions passed down for centuries tell us that, well beyond this one particular church on the Nile, throughout Egypt, the places where Jesus, Joseph, and Mary went are still held in special honor to this day. For example, there is a town in Egypt called Mustarad, or al Mahama. Al-Mahama means the bathing place. This is because in this place, Mary was said to have bathed Jesus and washed his clothes. In another place called Balbis, the Holy Family rested in the shade of a tree. This tree eventually came to be called the Virgin Mary's tree. In one place, an infant's handprint has been preserved in stone, believed to be the handprint of Jesus. And in another place, an infant's footprint has been preserved in the same way. Here is the point. For thousands of years, this people has been rightfully proud to say Jesus, Mary, and Joseph needed shelter, and we gave them refuge. The light of the world came, and we did not close our doors. 
Tragically, power-hungry Herod still carried out an infanticide against the infants and babies in and around Bethlehem. Helpless parents still wept. Funerals were still held. It's not something we talk about enough at Christmas. One glimpse at the news tells us that history repeats itself over and over and over again. Victims of human trafficking, victims of war, victims of prejudice, violence, and persecution. Victims of child abuse and neglect, victims of poverty. Tragedies still occur around the world and in our cities and in our towns. This Christmas right now, parents still weep. And so we think of Mark 9, 36 to 37. It's a passage that expresses the similar sentiment of Jesus' radical alignment and identification with the world's poor and suffering. This is our God's response to the power-hungry Herods of the world. Jesus took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. There it is again. Welcome and care for others, and you welcome and care for God. There is joy and purpose and challenge for anyone who decides not to be defined by humankind's borders, expectations, or priorities. It is the same blessing that is lived out in Matthew 25 as Jesus welcomes the compassionate righteous into his kingdom forever. There is joy and purpose and challenge in the small acts of love, offering food or water, listening, visiting prisoners, visiting the sick. There is joy in welcoming. So my question is this, who will you invite to your dinner table this Christmas? Or who will you invite to live in your guest room? Israel's loss was Egypt's gain. And while tragedy brought excruciating sorrow, welcoming those fleeing from tragedy brought another people a new sense of purpose, identity, and joy. To this day, every June 1st, the Egyptian church remembers and celebrates when Jesus, Mary, and Joseph entered Egypt. On that day, throughout the land, you hear this particular doxology. Rejoice, O Egypt, O people of Egypt, and all ye children of Egypt, who live within its borders. Rejoice and lift up your hearts for the lover of all mankind, he who has been before the beginning of ages, has come to you.